There we go. Firing up back uh, Instagram, sorry. And I had a little bit of a glitch there for a second. So welcome Instagrammers. Uh, we'll wait for you guys to kind of log back on. So um, I'm Dr. Michael Twyman. I'm a board certified cardiologist who's focusing on heart attack and stroke prevention in his practice, Apollo Cardiology. We're almost one year old as of August uh, of this uh, upcoming week. Um, and tonight we're gonna be talking about light water magnetism, the three things that are necessary for life on earth. Um, these are things that without, life doesn't exist. This is why there's no people or animals or things living on Mars. So um, I did briefly just go over uh, for my uh, uh, kind of email list, my patients. You know, I did launch a program this week, Eustos. It's a health optimization program. It's a biohacker dream. We monitor continuous glucose, your heart rate, your heart rate variability, your blood pressure as well as um, your, they already say continuous glucose, but, uh, uh, oh, it's your sleep. We're measuring your sleep quality. Um, I'm starting to help people optimize their sleep. Actually, had somebody reach out to me on Instagram, noticing that my uh, sleep scores are uh, pretty awesome and wanted to know how I did it. So chat with him the other day and kind of give some tips and tricks on how to optimize his sleep. Um, I will be having a health retreat. Helios is the name of the health retreat. It's the sun god. Pretty much all the you know, programs I have are named after some type of Greek god. Uh, but Helios ideally is going to be uh, uh, November 19th through the 22nd in Cancun. Um, this is depending on as long as everybody can travel internationally and everything kind of cools down with all this uh, pandemic stuff. So uh, Restos and Helios coming soon. Uh, there will be a webinar in Aristos uh, later this week, Friday at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. If you need the link, um, I do have it on um, my uh, email list, but also I've sent them out over DMs off Instagram. If you need it, just uh, send me a message and I'll shoot it to you. Um, I'm also working on a four-day biohacking course. It's going to basically go over the things we're talking about tonight, the light water magnetism, but it'll be in great detail. Uh, tonight we're just going through kind of the, the 10,000 foot uh, view of uh, light water magnetism. And then I'm also working on, not a book, but a uh, basically a protocol, a Twyman protocol that's going to have kind of my circadian day, how to optimize your energy in your mitochondria, what I personally do. Um, and it'll spell out, you know, what light bulbs I'm using, what photobiomodulation devices, what other kind of tips and gear that I tend to use. So, um, so that's just to catch up everybody on the Instagram. Uh, thank you for joining tonight, everybody. Um, and then lastly, I do want to... Uh, um, so I'll put a plug in for this program, uh, 75 Hard. I'm actually completing phase three of 75 Hard today. It's 75 days, a phase one, which is 30 days, a phase two, which is 30 days, and a phase three, which is 30 days. Each one somewhat gets progressively harder. Um, so it's a 165-day program. Um, today's the last day of it. Uh, it was the best uh, mental toughening, mental challenging program I ever put myself through. Yes, you definitely get a physical change out of it. You know, you're working out two times a day for 45 minutes a day, so you're definitely going to get a physical change, but it's much more mental. And I'll uh, credit it with definitely helping me kind of get mentally prepared to be able to become an entrepreneur and get Apollo Cardiology off the ground and up and running as, um, as fast as I was able to do it. Um, so uh, 75 Hard, uh, you definitely need to talk to me first if you're interested in doing it because you do need to kind of be uh, somewhat screened to make sure you're safe enough to start this program. but. Um, but if you haven't uh, heard about it, uh, just go look up this hashtag, 75 hard. Um, I'll probably have a post about it uh, tomorrow, uh, kind of my experiences with it. So uh, with that being said, uh, why don't we get started tonight? Um, so starting to talk about light water magnetism. First, heard about these three terms from Dr. Jack Cruz. You know, these are the three things that are necessary for life on any planet. Without one of them, life doesn't exist. This is why life doesn't exist on Mars. So you mostly hear me talk about the light. We'll talk about that somewhat tonight. We'll, then we'll also explain what you know the water magnetism part is. But it's always gonna go back to yeah, this is my favorite like little toy I brought lately. Is you know it's the little mitochondria guy that I always uh, kind of pop out. But the mitochondria these used to be their own little uh, bacteria essentially, and then a long time ago they merged with these different cells, and that symbiotic relationship uh, was good for both. So the uh, the mitochondria got a cozy place to stay. And their uh, trade-off was they provided energy for the host cell um, while the host cell took care of it. But for now, the mitochondria, those are basically your powerhouses. The main thing they do, they make energy for your system. They do a lot of other things, but just think about mainly as the powerhouses of the cells. So they basically need the light water magnetism to work optimally. 
They're essentially sensors for your environment. So light, that's pretty self-explanatory. You know, I got a red light behind me. You've all seen a rainbow, um, hopefully. So those different wavelengths of light interact with your eyes, your skin, your gut when you eat foods, and your mitochondria are sensing those colors of light. Um, that's why outside light, you know, programs your hormones a different way than sitting in front of the technology that we're, you know, sharing this information over tonight. You know, your body gets a different signal with the different intensities of light that are hitting it. Um, you know, your body actually makes light, which always sounds weird, but, you know, when you shiver and make heat, that heat is infrared. Um, you can't see it, but you can feel it. You know, and if you have one of the flare guns or what the firefighters use to look into fires, they can see heat coming off of, you know, people or they can see where the fire is at from the walls. Um, just because you can't see it doesn't mean your mitochondria aren't interacting with it. So light programs many uh, different processes in the body. You know, the, it triggers different cellular signals. Your hormones get released differently the way the light hits it. Neurotransmitters get released differently the way the light hits it. So you need to program your light through Mother Nature. So that's why you always hear me talking about sunrises and wearing blue biking glasses to try to set your signals up by the way Mother Nature intended it to be. Um, you know, the other thing about light is that, you know, the mitochondria, you know, just they, you know, they give up heat. Um, this is one reason, I should back up a little bit. You know, the mitochondria, yes, they used to be bacteria, but you know, where do you get your mitochondria? You get them from your mom, and she got it from her mom. And so if you do 23andMe, there's something called the um, mitochondrial haplotype. It'll basically tell you where your original maternal line came from. And knowing that will somewhat influence, does sun run your batteries better? Or does cold run your batteries better? Or can you do both? Um, and we'll talk about cold under the magnetism section tonight. But if you know what your haplotype is, you'll know if you're tightly coupled or loosely coupled. When you hear me say that, you know, think of fingers close together or far away. So if they're coupled, this is something where energy goes through the system really fast without a lot of heat loss. If the mitochondria are uncoupled, the proteins that are in the mitochondria, they're further apart, energy doesn't go as fast through there, and heat is coming off like a radiator. That heat keeps you from freezing when you live way up north. So the mitochondria's main job is to sense the environment, the light environment, and it's also when you eat foods, which is essentially, you know, light grows the plant and you eat the plant, or you eat the animal that ate the plant. So your body is digesting light for the most part. That food it goes into mitochondria, not as a carbohydrate, a protein, or a fat, but it actually gets broken down to the subatomic layer where it's broken down into electrons, which are negatively charged, and protons, which are positively charged. And the mitochondria have a little dance where they pass the electron down this little chain, and the way it passes it, energy is created at the end. At the end, there's this little top. The faster it spins, more energy comes out. It makes ATP. So the mitochondria make ATP, which is energy, it also makes water, it makes a special type of water called deuterium depleted water, and it also makes carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is a waste product, you breathe it out. But what's nice for plants is they like carbon dioxide, they use the carbon dioxide, start the photosynthesis process back over, they make carbohydrates, you eat the carbohydrates. So the cycle goes around. So, but the main things that you're concerned about are how much ATP can it make and how much high quality water can it make. Yes, it's important the water that goes into your system, but it's more important that what water is made in your mitochondria. And the water in your mitochondria, again, is something called deuterium depleted. Deuterium is a heavy hydrogen. Hydrogen is you know, attached to almost all the molecules in your body, but there's kind of two types. There's regular hydrogen and there's uh, heavier hydrogen, deuterium. It has a um, neutron and a proton, where hydrogen just has a proton, so it's twice as heavy. It is somewhat complicated uh, quantum, uh, quantum medicine to kind of really go through the details of it, but the easiest way to kind of think about deuterium is that it provides energy into certain systems. But because it's so big, certain systems won't run with it. So if the ATP, the thing that makes energy, is like a turnstile, the deuterium is so big, it makes the turnstile spin slower, so less energy can come out. So deuterium, is not necessarily all bad, it's just bad when it's in the wrong places. And most water that you're going to drink, it's definitely gonna have deuterium in it, but there's different levels of deuterium. 
And this is kind of a complicated subject, which I'll get into if I end up doing the uh, kind of the four-day biohacking course. I'll go a little bit more deep into to, to deuterium. But essentially, you don't want to drink water that uh, has excessively high levels of deuterium if you can help with it. You don't have to necessarily go for the deuterium depleted water unless you have cancer or an autoimmune condition. But the thing is that the water that you want to drink, you know, should be as clean as possible. So somewhat, you know, from order to, uh, you know, least desirable, you know, you would like to probably have glacial spring water, reverse osmosis water. It's about the order I would, I personally probably would drink the things. Um, the main thing is you want to avoid fluoride. And it's not because fluoride is necessarily good or bad for your teeth, but fluoride, when it's in the water, it inhibits the way the water will store energy. There's a uh, interesting um, book called The Fourth Phase of Water by Gerald Pollack, Dr. Pollack. I explained this uh, stage of water where the water is more gelatinous and it actually is something which can store energy, like a battery. And your cells likely make this in the mitochondria. So when light hits your skin, the water that your mitochondria are making will charge separate. So the negative side and the positive side will separate. The red light that comes in from the sun, also the UV light that comes in from the sun, makes that exclusion zone bigger. It's a bigger battery. So it's another source of energy for the mitochondria. So it's energy that your mitochondria can use that don't require food to go in the system. Because when you put food into the system, you know, it's sort of like putting food into an engine, you know, there's combustion and there's, you know, byproducts and there's reactive oxygen species, stuff that, you know, causes cell signaling, but too much reactive oxygen species can make your body rust. Um, so you don't want to overdo putting too much food in the system because you wear the system down by doing that. So if you're getting energy by more of the light causing the water to expand, that's better. This is probably one of the reasons why when you go to a beach vacation, you're not nearly as hungry for food because the sun is literally charging up the water batteries in your system. And then the third thing you need is magnetism. That's probably the most complicated one. That's one I can't actually even easily explain to you, but you all kind of intuitively know what magnetism is. So if something else, it's metal and metal, it either sticks together or repels when you got a magnet. Well, magnetism um, has something to do with the way uh, the mitochondria work as well, and that the um, magnetism essentially is, yeah, this is where it hits again more complicated quantum physics, I was like, wherever there's an electrical field, 90 degrees to it is a magnetic field. Um, so if the magnetic field is strong, when I was talking about where the energy is going through the, uh, the mitochondria protein, respiratory proteins, if you have a tight or a strong magnetic field, the faster you can put those electrons through the system. Um, you know, the things that, uh, you know, cause magnetic field for the Earth is mainly the sun. Um, as the sun hits the Earth, there's um, less magnetic fields during the daytime, and then when the sun goes away, you know, the sunset, the magnetic fields come up. Your mitochondria sense that change in magnetism, and that's one of the other things that tells your body it's nighttime, time to go to sleep. Um, so, you know, it's something that, you know, is complicated, but there's things that can do that can improve that magnetic signaling. Um, cold therapy, cold thermogenesis is one of those things. The colder things are, the faster electrons flow. This is why semiconductors are frequently cooled down. The faster that they're cool down, the faster that the information can be passed along the silicone chip, um, the faster the computing happens. Your body basically can do that as well, the cooler it is. Um, there is something called the Magnetico. I've not personally experienced it, but it's a mattress pad. It's like 20 Teslas of, uh, I believe, uh, don't quote me, I can't believe it's, I don't remember if it's Teslas or Micro Teslas, but anyway, it's a very strong magnet that you lay on. And you would only lay on it at nighttime because then it tells your body it's nighttime and your body is able to sense this magnetic field and it'll repel other electric fields that it sees in the environment and your body can go to sleep. Um, this is the reason you hear me talk about, you know, having a sleep cave where you don't have a lot of EMFs, you don't have your phone, you don't have your Wi-Fi on because you don't want your mitochondria to be sensing these non-native EMFs at nighttime. It messes up the body's ability to repair itself at nighttime. So I think that's the, uh, the main things I wanted to chat about tonight was that, you know, it's light water magnetism. It's, you know, the basics of, you know, what you need to be alive. 
Um, and the more that you understand about light wire magnetism, the more you can fine tune the way your personal mitochondria work in your local environment. Um, like I said, I will be uh, hopefully launching a biohacking health optimization course in the near future to really go deep into it to, when people want to learn more about this. But just thought it'd be a good uh, intro tonight uh, to hit upon the topics if you haven't heard me speak about this before. So, um, so with that, I'll stop the kind of formal part of the uh, discussion tonight and uh, open up to questions. And I'll, uh, on the uh, people off joining from Zoom, I'll click it so that you can unmute yourself. And if you'd like to unmute yourself, go ahead, or you can uh, click on the chat box and ask a question. Question, good, yes. So uh, grounding, um, I didn't touch upon it tonight, but uh, um, grounding or earthing is sometimes the other term for it. Uh, that's when you're not wearing uh, shoes and you're, uh, don't necessarily have to, shouldn't say not wearing shoes, most likely not wearing shoes, and you're actually connecting to the earth. So I briefly mentioned that you know, when the sun hits the earth, free electrons are released. Um, those electrons, if you're barefoot on the earth or you're on something that's man-made, not, I um, should say, that's natural, not man-made. So if it's sand, dirt, grass, you know, your body's able to connect to the earth. You are grounded to the earth. Those electrons will come up through your feet um, or if you're, you know, got your hands on the ground too. Uh, this is one of the reasons why, suspect it, why, you know, your hands and feet sweat is because when things are wet, you make a tighter connection. That's the reason why in the morning time, the grass has dew on it. If your feet are wet and the grass is wet, you have a good connection, you can earth and ground better. Um, so your body pulls in those electrons. It's very anti-inflammatory, lowers the blood pressure, makes your blood more like red wine, less like ketchup. And it also feeds the mitochondria energy without you having to eat the food. Um, another reason why you're probably not as hungry when you're on a beach vacation. Um, now it gets a little bit complicated that as the um, non-native EMFs keep increasing in the environment, is earthing grounding going to be good for you? It's going to be hard to tell. You know, if you're in a high 5G uh, cell tower network region, earthing grounding might not be that great for you because when you're then connected to the earth, you're also then connected to all these 5G signals and those things jam the mitochondria, cause inflammation and cause some significant issues. So earth and grounding in a 5G world may not be um, as beneficial, may actually be harmful because of something called jump conduction. But um, if that's a kind of a complicated idea and you know there's not great meters at this time to test and know what's going on with that. So if you got earth and grounding, you feel really bad afterwards, maybe you're just in the wrong environment to be doing it. Uh, question, any thoughts on acupuncture uh, and some treatments with heat to boost magnetism? Um, I don't think necessarily that heat would increase magnetism because it's mostly cold, um, but acupuncture, you know, essentially human touch, um, you know, or putting pins in uh, the skin makes the, the body release different wavelengths of light. Um, you know, this is, you know, sicker cells release more extreme low frequency UV light than healthy cells. So when you're healthy, you hold on to the light and that light then does different processes in the system. But a cell that is sick literally leaks out this light. You cannot see the light. And there's some very, very sensitive detectors that they can put people in and they can measure who's putting out more light than they should. The people who put more light out have more diseases. Um, so, um, but the thought is that when you're putting acupuncture needles in, you're actually putting um, energy into the systems and you're redirecting the way the light is being transmitted in the body. That's one of the thoughts how it actually works. Um, I have a question from uh, Instagram, you know, questions on distilled water. Um, the, the issue with distilled water is then it's somewhat um, dead water. Um, it doesn't have all the minerals and things that the body would use to do different uh, enzymatic processes. So if you have distilled water, you need to add the minerals back. And the, and the exact concentrations, I can't tell you. You'd have to kind of see you know, what's actually getting stripped out uh, with, the, with the distilled water that you're using. Let's 
So personally, I drink mostly spring water. Um, you know, there are some you know really uh, water aficionados that change the water through the seasons. I, I pretty much stick to spring water year round. Um, you know, I am somewhat of a, a, a water uh, aficionado when I travel. I try to get the cleanest water I can. I don't care if it's in plastic when I'm traveling. Um, the clean water is more important than that it was in plastic. So most of the time, you know, I usually get Avion or Pellegrino if I can find it when I'm traveling. Uh, question, how long is in minutes? Should you be barefoot to reap any benefits? Um, I don't know if there's an exact uh, number of minutes, but uh, it's like most things in life for this is, you know, the more time the better. I mean, humans evolved outside. You know, humans evolved to be outside 90% of the time. And in the late 1800s with the light bulbs, um, then people came inside. And when you're inside, you're not connected to the earth. Um, and you're also getting non-native EMS from all these different light bulbs. And so more time, the better um, is usually the answer. And do I personally do it enough? No, um, but at the time I'm not sick. My mitochondria seem to be working well, but definitely when I'm on you know, a beach vacation, yeah, I, I barely take my shoes off for an entire week. Um, so the sicker you are, the more time you need on it. Um, question, does distilling remove fluoride? Um, most likely it does. Um, you know, but not, not a home distiller. You need a, you know, extremely high temperature one to probably be able to strip that out. Um, so it's better to get stuff that is naturally unfluoridated. You know, almost any of the products at home that are going to be said that they can take out fluoride, they possibly can, but they use extremely expensive filters and you have to exchange the filters very frequently. There's nothing that you're gonna have like a, you know, little pour water over a filter and it's gonna strip out the fluoride. It has to be a fairly uh, complex process. So it's usually better just to get water that doesn't have it to begin with. And glacial water and spring water, for the most part, aren't going to have fluoride in it. All right. We're coming up upon that uh, half hour mark, and I'm always happy to stay a little bit longer if there's more questions coming in. But if there's not more questions coming in, you know, I always thank you guys for joining me tonight. I will be back next Monday, 6.30. I should say 6 p.m. Central Time. Uh, topic, uh, probably two to be determined, but uh, maybe I'll go a little bit deeper into light, water, or magnetism, or more than likely I'll probably go back to an open Q&A. We had a good one uh, two, three weeks ago, and then through some technical difficulties, I... Uh, hit the wrong button, didn't record it. So um, I uh, apologize for that. And so uh, maybe we'll just another open uh, Q&A. All right. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining tonight. I try. <laughs> All right. Uh, one more question coming in. That's a good one. Um, what about the water for showers? Um, complicated. Um, I have not personally um, tried to mitigate this for myself. I mostly focus on the water I'm actually consuming, but it is true that, you know, uh, you know the, the showers, especially when you're taking a hot shower, you know, on 75 hard, uh, part of it's you're taking cold showers, that probably a little less effect to me at this point. Um, but hot showers will you know, make the fluoride you know, aerosolize and you're breathing in through your nose and mouth um, and your skin pores pull it in. So if you're somebody who has a lot of chronic conditions, it may be worthwhile to have a, a system that uh, um, treats the water before it comes out of the shower, but those can tend to be fairly pricey. I mean, you can get a whole house reverse osmosis system set up um, there are some filters you can screw into the head of the shower itself. I've not uh, played around with any of them, but, um, but they are pretty readily available online for that. All right.
Uh, another question coming in. Uh, any uh, benefits of seasonal diets? Yes, I mean, that's what I would go into in the, uh, into the kind of the course or the, uh, the Aristos thing. But the, the, the basic of it is that, you know, you want to eat what's seasonally in your environment because that's what your body's light environment expects. So, you know, if the light is, you know, strong, carbohydrates grow. If the light is not strong, carbohydrates do not grow. So you eat what's growing locally and your body can digest it. And basically the barcodes in your mitochondria know what's going on with that. You know, the example is if you live way north and you're eating, you know, food that's, you know, like a pineapple in uh, you know, Canada, well, there's no such thing as pineapples in Canada. Your body's like, there's no way the light grew this in Canada. How's this getting into my system? So yes, you should be trying to eat more seasonally. And then there's a, there is a question um, that, uh, you know, somebody can't attend my uh, uh, talk on Friday. Um, it's likely to be recorded, but it's only be recorded uh, for the people that actually attend, but I will be having uh, other webinars in the future on the, on the same topic. Well, again, I thank you guys for joining me tonight. It's always great to catch up, and I'll be back next Monday, 6 o'clock Central Time. Have a great week. Thanks.